Broadcasting on the internet airwaves from the great state of Minnesota, my name is Sean and you're listening to The Sean Tabbitt Show. Today my special guest is Cliff Graham and we're going to be discussing his book Shadow of the Mountain, Exodus, which is published by my employer, actually this time around, Bethany House Publishers. Cliff, welcome to the show. Thanks, Sean. Thanks for having me on. I'm excited to be here. Well, first things first, let's have you start off and and take a few moments to introduce yourself to the audience. So I am a former pastor's kid. Uh, Not former, I guess, still current pastor's kid. I uh, grew up in the church and became involved in ministry myself, worked as a youth pastor and associate pastor was then I joined the army and I was a, a military police officer for a while, both enlisted and officer side. And then I became an army chaplain. And then after about 15 years in the military, I got out. And so now I am an author, full-time author and media content producer and live in Utah with my wife and our four kids. All right. Well, thanks for introducing yourself. It's always helpful to get a little context of who we're talking to every time. Now, when people think of Christian fiction, And especially with me working at Bethany House, I think folks are often going to be thinking of Amish fiction, romance Mm -hmm. novels, and other books that are going to largely appeal to women. I'd be curious to hear your backstory. How did you come to the realization that there was a need and a space within Christian fiction for what I'd call gritty, manly fiction? That's a great question, and I think it's got several layers to it. (laughs) Because I think when I first started out on this, I made the mistake of looking at what was currently in the market as a problem and not simply there's a void there. And when I first began my career, this is probably, I guess, seven or eight years ago, I started dabbling in it. And I saw all of the bonnets and the butter churns and things like that that were out there. And and saw that as a problem, but that was my own immaturity at play. I didn't realize that, no, that's fine that that's there. There's many very talented, gifted authors, people being blessed by those stories. God's using that stuff. But there is a gaping yaw of a black void for stuff that is, I think, geared directly at men. And even the stuff that I think was being published for men, it was being feminized. And I don't mean, again, that's not a critique. It's just simply an observation that there's a reason why most of the purchasing going on in Christian bookstores for books is by women, even though there are options for men. But I think that even those options had a sanitized take. And so what I decided to do was, after my time in the military and after looking at what there was available in the market, realizing that there was kind of a myth in the Christian publishing industry. I did everything that a new author does. You know, I started going to conferences and reading the blogs and all that, agent blogs. And so I realized that there was this belief that, oh, well, men just don't read as much as women. Okay, maybe there's some objective data that points to that. But I also know if you look at the New York Times bestseller list, you will see Vince Flynn and people like that who are writing robustly selling male-driven fiction, spy novels, action novels. The reason that they're more popular is I think they come closer to telling the truth to a male reader as a male understands things. This is not a ringing endorsement of all of those of those kinds of books. It's just I think they scratch the surface of why Tom Clancy, for example, was such a mega selling author for so long. He had female readers as well, but men were what made him as massive as he was as an author. And so I started researching, okay, well, are there other authors out there, male historical fiction authors that generate big revenues, big sales? And to me, it's not so much about the money as it is getting an audience, you know, who's got a huge audience. And I looked at Bernard Cornwell and Wilbur Smith and a lot of these authors that had just millions and millions of copies sold. And of course, the all-time seller, Louis L'Amour, the way he wrote his cowboy stories and frontier stories. I mean, we're talking hundreds of millions of copies between these authors that have been sold around the world in all these languages. And I thought that's who we have to tap. I I refuse to believe that Christian men or guys that would buy from a Christian bookstore in those outlets or through the church wouldn't gravitate to that content if it was presented to them a certain way. So, okay, I, I realized that and I believe that held fast to that. But then the trick was, how do you convince a publisher to believe in your grand vision? Because their bottom line and I fully respect it, is driven by a certain type of book and project. And people that have a problem with that, I want to challenge them and say, your business is driven by a bottom line appreciation of who your customer is. So again, these are not critiques of the industry. I just think it was up to me and my team to really prove and break down the brick wall about what kind of stuff could sell in a Christian market. And we knew that 
we had to both promote to a Christian audience and to a non-Christian audience and, and really try and be that crossover story. To carry that one step further, I, I realized that where there was a, a void in particular, according to my passion and experiences, was the way that men perceived and read the Bible. I knew that there was a huge gap between what I think men believe is in the Bible and what the Bible actually has written. Most guys that go to church, I shouldn't say most guys, but there's a lot of guys that go to church because their wife is making them go. They're showing up on Sunday morning, they're bored out of their mind, they're staring at the ceiling, and they think that the Bible is just Jesus petting lambs and bubble gum and gumdrops for everybody. That's, of course, wrong. And, and they miss out on the passion and narrative arc of the Bible where they realize, man, this is the greatest story. And, and you see wars and battles and triumph and evil and good and all these things clashing. And that draws the heart of a man, I believe, specifically. Anyway, all that being said was what pointed me towards getting my first series out the door was the movie 300 came out. And I was a youth pastor at that time. And I noticed that the teenage boys in the room, this is an inner city church in San Antonio, loved ministering there, but it was a very different crowd than what I grew up in. <laughs> you know, middle class white guy. I mean, that's what I was, but I had to find common ground with these students that were different ethnicities, different backgrounds. And so that movie 300 came out and I saw those boys talking and buzzing about that on Wednesday nights. And I had had a ski trip with some buddies of mine and I, where we led a youth trip uh, to go skiing. And we had noticed the same phenomena. If we told them the stories of David and his mighty men, for example, or Samson or any of those, the boys would listen and they'd lock in on you. But if you went somewhere else, the girls are there studiously with their notepads, taking notes and spitting out the scripture. I mean, the, the girls were always locked in, but the guys were just, you could just see it. There was something missing for how they were connecting. Again, not that the scriptures weren't sufficient. I just think the way that we were presenting them was insufficient. Anyway, all that led to me writing and researching my first series, the Line of War series based on King David and his warriors uh, wanted to take the Saving Private Ryan Band of Brothers approach to that and really go there in a hard, demanding manner, if that makes sense. I mean, really go there and push the line on violence, on intensity. I should almost say darkness because there's a lot of darkness in the human soul. So really portraying that and showing exactly how heroic God was to save these people out of the filth they lived in. And so, again, to reach the male audience, and I, I knew this as a chaplain of soldiers, I knew this as a youth, I mean, all these things that I could tell, I had to give them the unvarnished, stripped away truth. And I tried to write those books with that in mind. And that was the, like I said, that was the one that we broke down the brick wall with to show, I think, the Christian publishing industry, no, this has an audience. If you market this right, if you push this right, and if you have just a lot of blood and guts and passion in it in a way that I think is honoring to the story and not distracting from it, I think men will connect. I was just going to say, you know, hats off for mentioning Louis L'Amour, one of my all-time favorite authors. I think I've read 80 or so of his books mm -hmm. to date. Oh, yeah. And I think there, if we can tap in as a Christian fiction market into a quality, well-written, honest story like he was able to craft in so many of his books, they're almost timeless because you see Louis's mm -hmm. books continuing just to sell very well today, long after he's. I mean, in been supermarket gone. checkout aisles. Yeah. I mean, it's like, yeah, I agree. You see those because they are timeless. Yeah. And a Western, you know, Westerns of all things. I mean, is, mm -hmm. is there a huge readership today? Who knows? <laughs> you know, I, I think another thing too is there's been a tendency, especially in Christian fiction, to whitewash characters, especially male characters, or just make mm -hmm. them almost angelic or Christ like in mm -hmm. some ways versus being honest that these were real people with real problems, they did sinful things, and making them seem believable, which I think is what probably has helped readers really connect with your stories. Yeah, I mean, you, you hit on it there. The very thing that I, I think drives me most, I guess that I'm most ardent about when I try and create characters, is that I'm trying to create them according to what reality reflects. And reality for a man is that life is hard, continual battle period. It just is. Now, there's bright spots. There's moments of joy. I mean, there's all these things that are there. But I think if, you, if a man is honest with himself, you have to evaluate your, I guess I could use the word sanctification. You have to evaluate your spiritual sanctification based upon progress and trajectory, not the final result. And I think a lot of these books are written with the final result in mind, where, where the heroic cowboy comes in from the mountains and has solved things and fixed it all. He's now pining away for his lost love. I mean, all these things that Again, I don't want to say that those are all fake. I just don't think they tell the whole story. And I personally believe that part of why my stuff is starting to resonate is because I've tried to be 
as open and honest with the characters as possible, letting them meet the fate they choose. For example, there's not always a happy ending. I got some kickback on my first novel because it's part of a series, so there's more to come, but it ended with a really vague, open-ended, we don't really know what's going to happen with this character. And you'd be surprised, maybe you wouldn't be surprised during the industry, but I got a lot of pushback on that because there were retailers and homeschool groups and hey, we homeschool our kids, I love, (laughs) but there were a lot of people that were pushing back. I think they were trying to say, where's the hope in this story? And I pushed back and said, I think there's an incredible amount of hope in this story. It's a man realizing he's bankrupt apart from God. He needs God's grace in his life to fulfill his destiny. He's not going to just figure it out. So I think that is the honesty and willingness to portray that because here's the kicker. The Bible holds no punches when it comes to portraying people at their, both their best and their worst. I mean, it's the longest chapter of David's story. One of the longest chapters of David's story is the whole agonizing sequence with Uriah and Bathsheba. And you're getting him. Here's this enormously heroic biblical figure. But the longest stretch of storytelling is devoted to his worst sin. I mean, how weird is that? I mean, that's just not how Christian fiction does things generally. They're trying to focus on the good stuff and not the bad. So you started with David, and now you're working backwards to Exodus. And I know every book, you know, I talk to a lot of authors, I know every book has its own unique backstory. How did the idea or, you know, when did Shadow of the Mountain start forming in your mind? It had been in the hopper for a while. I really do have a pretty well sketched out. I want to say I don't have my career sketched out, <laughs> but, but I have a pretty good idea of what stories I want to cover before I'm done. And I'm, I'm still a, a relatively young man. And so if, if God gives me gears, I would like to cover a number of stories. And one of the ones that I've, I've always thought, my passion is to bring the hidden nooks of the Bible alive. So you tell the larger story with a famous character, but maybe you tell it through the eyes of someone who doesn't give a lot of screen time, I guess, in the Bible. As a storytelling device, that works because I like to layer a lot of fiction into it. And so if I'm dealing with a main character who is more obscure, I can give them a whole backstory that people don't know. For even my King David series, David is not the main character in that series. It's the mighty men. So you have Benaiah and all those guys that come to him and they're mentioned a couple times. So I use them as the window into the life of David. And so you encounter David as a character, as a relationship that's mysterious and unknown in the same way. So I looked at that and saw Caleb was a character. When I travel and speak at men's conferences and events, I love bringing him up because he gives that really incredible speech in the book of Joshua, where he's 85 years old. And he tells Joshua, I'm just as strong as I've ever been. Give me this mountain. I want to claim my inheritance. There's giants and walled cities there. I want to go attack them and drive them out. And I just, oh, I still even mentioning that now get goosebumps thinking about how great that scene must have been. Because here's this guy, he's 85, you know, he's old. And he's the last of the, it was just him and Joshua that made it through the wandering in the wilderness. They were the only two that crossed over into the promised land. And so from the perspective of the Israelites, these are their two elders, their wizened old elders. And the oldest men that any of them know because that whole other generation died out. And so with Moses gone, I thought Caleb would have had that battle buddy relationship with Joshua that started all those decades ago when they were spying together and it lasting. And so here you see, instead of this old man sitting back on his golf course or looking for his beachfront property as his inheritance, kind of how we would approach it. He's going, look, I'm just as strong as I've ever been. Don't you dare put me into retirement. I want to go and conquer a walled city. I just felt like that in this day and age was the story we needed to hear, especially for men, that we don't just work for comfort. We don't just work to achieve and sit on it. We actually at 85 should still be looking for giants to kill. Yeah. And I think that's one of the things that's really going to resound with readers. On the one hand, even as we're into retirement, God still has a lot of work for us to Mm do. And I think for younger men, we need to be willing to A, admit that we don't always know everything. And B, we need to look to those wizened old elders for feedback, for advice, for their counsel, because, Mm -hmm. well, to be honest, they know a lot more than we do sometimes. And God's taught them a lot more through the years. So maybe we can learn from them and avoid a few of our own mistakes along the way. (laughs) That's the truth. Set the stage for us. What's the time span that you're covering in this book? And what are some of the destinations, places, battles that we're going to accompany Joshua and Caleb along the way? Yeah, so it's going to be a trilogy. This series with Bethany is a trilogy. It is broken up into three chunks of time that I think most people will recognize from uh, at least the first two from the life of Moses. It begins with the events in Egypt that lead up to and take place during the Exodus. So when the Israelites are released, 
and it will, um, and I'll elaborate a little bit more on that in a minute, but then it will transition in book two. So that's book one is that's why the subtitle is Exodus. And then book two, it will be in the wilderness. And so that's what we're calling it. Book two is wilderness. And so it will have them in the, the wilderness, wandering around, learning their tough lessons, getting attacked by Amalekites. So there's going to be battles and excitement and all that. And then in book three is the conquest phase where they are crossing over Jordan, Moses dies. And then again, these are, if someone thinks these are spoilers, just it's in the Bible. So I'm not really giving a whole lot away, but when Moses dies, Joshua and Caleb as the war chiefs basically lead the people. And we have Jericho and all that stuff that happens up until the end of both of their lives. And so Caleb is, he's probably the primary character, but just as important, especially from book two on will be Joshua because everyone knows about Moses. We had Charles and Heston movies. It seems like every time Hollywood approaches this story, Ridley Scott just did it last year, it's always Moses-centered, which is fine. I get it. Moses is a fascinating character. Also interesting are guys like Joshua and Caleb, who were, were not the spotlight characters, but they saw and experienced everything, and they leave incredible legacies for us if we look at them. And you've already touched on some of the themes, but I'd like to explore a bit. When readers get to the end of Shadow of the Mountain, what are the themes you really hope that they've picked up on? And if they would go ahead and have a call to action, or if their Christian walk or how they approach the Bible is going to be affected, how do you hope this book does that? Without going too far into exactly how it ends, I hope that the takeaway is that, I mentioned it a little bit earlier, that the idea of aging and how that affects you, how that affects your plans. I think we like to make our plans for the next five to 10 years because we don't think in terms of what am I going to be doing when I'm 75? You know, <laughs> we, don't, we don't like to think that far ahead. But you can make choices now where you set yourself up for good battle later in life as an old man or woman, too. I mean, you have the chance now to live as though your best days are always ahead of you. Now, the Lord may take you home tomorrow, and that's fine. It shouldn't matter how you live. You should still live and plan like you're going to make it that long. Because I love these epitaphs that are given to these people in Scripture when it says, so-and-so died old and full of years, the servant of the Lord. I just love that. I mean, I hope that's on my tombstone where you know, Joshua dies, an old man, it says, and thus died Joshua, the servant of the Lord. I just think that's a great way to go out. And so even if your life is cut short based upon your timeline, but God takes you home, you still set your legacy up as though when you're 85 or 90 and you go, there's quotes in the book that I'm trying to pepper in of inspiring people to think, you know, I want it to be written about me this and, and just have that legacy mindset. And it's hard. It's so hard in this day and age to think about when you're in your 20s or 30s, what your legacy is. But I believe that those people in those days, in a very different culture and time, they were very aware of things like honor and legacy and your family name and things like that, that I think our culture could really benefit from a little bit of a gravitation towards. And so that's the purpose with this series. The first book, of course, ends at the point of the Exodus concluding but it is told a little bit about how the narrative technique works in it, because I think I've gotten a lot of good feedback about how people like how this book is written. It's an old man, Caleb, narrating his past to his nephew, Othniel, who is, becomes a judge, becomes a, a heroic character in his own right. But it takes place in the present just in about a single day. And they're waiting on this storm to pass so they can attack the walled city. So Caleb's 85. He's just given his great speech. And so they're waiting to conquer their inheritance. But the weather's too bad. So in the tent... Othniel asks him to talk about the old days. And so most of the book is narrated in the first person as he walks us through how he came to Egypt, what happened in Egypt, the plagues, all that stuff. And I wanted that storytelling device to also be emphasizing that idea of listen to your elders. You know, they have wisdom. You may be a young stud and you got a, a promising career ahead and that's all great, but they have gray hair for a reason. And you want to learn from their mistakes and their lessons before you make them yourself. And then you can advance the kingdom that much farther if you're not wasting time repeating the errors that they already made. Well, and that's really helpful. I think one of the challenges we face today is we don't like to, like you said, we don't like to think about what's coming tomorrow or next year, let alone decades from now. But I think one of the things we need to realize is as we're thinking generationally, the decisions we make today are going to impact our children, our grandchildren, and beyond that, where Mm -hmm. The fruit of our labors today, we may never see in our lifetime, but two, three, four generations down the line, that could have a great impact on mm -hmm. the generations that are going to come after us. Yeah. And I think in Proverbs speaks to this, my two favorite books, just as far as what they, I guess, how they help me in my life and what I, they teach me about the nature of God. The ones that impact me are Ecclesiastes and Proverbs. And people think that's usually a weird one. Ecclesiastes, isn't that the sad one? 
but it's because it's so honest. You know, it's you struggle, you go through things. God is frequently silent when he's doing his things. And so you're I just like the honesty that that author portrays. But between the Proverbs and Ecclesiastes, that's where you glean the wisdom of thinking about your integrity, your legacy, what you leave behind. I mean, the scripture talks about how a good name is more valuable than gold. And I mean, I think that that idea of a good name is so critical. It's God honoring. But even though those are quote unquote Old Testament books, what people tend to do is they throw everything out in the Old Testament because when Jesus came, everything changed. No, (laughs) that's not accurate at all. Some things shifted, yes, in the way that we interact with God, but it's scripture too. The Old Testament is absolutely scripture and it contains timeless wisdom that we would do well to pay attention to. Well, and just a quick book idea I'm going to throw out there for somebody, since we don't get exposed to it a lot when we're young in Sunday school, Ecclesiastes for Toddlers. So if somebody wants to run yeah, with right. that, be my guest. <laughs> yep. I'm not planning on pursuing it, so there you go. I talk to a lot of authors, and a lot of folks tell me that they're personally changed in the midst of each writing experience. Uh, was there anything particularly meaningful that you learned or experienced as you were working on this book? Oh, every day. I mean, I, I don't know how you can write any kind of fiction. I mean, I can, I, maybe there's some ways I could imagine it not being the case, but if you're writing historical fiction or especially biblical fiction, there's so much in the, even in the research process that you just, your eyes are open to a perspective and a vantage point that you never thought of before. And I think what drives you through the hard days and hours of typing and deleting and typing and deleting and typing and deleting is that your passion for other people to experience that aha moment is there. And so honestly, it's the most fun part. And writing is very hard. It's brutal. I've heard some people say, oh, it's just so easy. I sat down and cranked out. That's great. I do not recommend listening to that advice all the time (laughs) because it's very difficult to get a, I think, what a well-crafted final product. It's a labor of love, basically. And so to get that in the reader's hands is immensely rewarding because you have learned lessons along the way that you get to now share with others. Not as, you know, you haven't put yourself up as the high teacher for them. You're just saying, look, I'm giddy to share this with you because I think it's got great stuff in this story. I learned so much. I mean, little random historical tidbits here there that I, my prayer is that if people read my book, that it would never, of course, substitute for the Bible and it would just be a gateway to the Bible. They would go, okay, I'm going to read the scriptures differently than I ever have before. I've never thought of these people as flesh and blood humans that are like me just a few thousand years removed. Well, and now we're going to transition away from the book. So thanks for giving us some insights into what folks are going to encounter when they read that. I always like to get a few other pieces of information from each author. So I'm going to pick your brain a bit. Looking back on your own Christian journey, are there, say, one or two books that either A, really impacted you most, or if you were going to gift a book to somebody, what book might you gift to somebody? Uh, You know, I I think that there's, it depends on what they are pursuing, if, if it's someone who's pursuing writing, or if it's just someone I'm saying, hey, this should impact you. If someone is in of a mind to maybe replicate or do what I do, where they write historical war fiction, something like that, the book that impacted me profoundly was The Killer Angels by Michael Shara. And that was about the Civil War Battle of Gettysburg. It was told in a few brief days, something about the way that guy captured the mind of a soldier in combat itself. Again, I don't use the word profound lightly. It was profound for me. It inspired my whole career. Another one was called Last of the Breed by Louis L'Amour. I just loved that book because Louis L'Amour, he was the unquestioned master of making you feel like you were sitting around a campfire listening to a story being told. You could smell the wood smoke and see the flames and the snow is gently falling. Like He just was the master at that imagery. So I'd say on the fiction side, those are the two in my genre that I think you just have to read to get an idea of what creating an atmosphere looks like. And then there's, of course, there's the biblical side of things, what spiritually impacted me. You know, I just, I always loved Desiring God. Some of those old classics love reading these generationally consistent works. Spurgeon, you know, he, his insight into the mind and heart of God. I'm a, you know, can be a grumpy old reformed guy sometimes. So I love reading Spurgeon, all of them, because they just had such a a well-rounded view. God wasn't just love and cupcakes all the time. He had righteousness and justice and love and all these things. And they just, so I, I don't know if you're trying to research the mind and heart of God apart from the word, you start with the word, obviously, but then, you know, I think those are the great nonfiction approaches to him. Since Louis L'Amour is a pet favorite subject of mine, I'm going to jump mm-hmm. back on him for a minute. I think one of the things that really made his writing unique is 
he visited a lot of the locations that he wrote about. I mean, he was very intense mm-hmm. about personally doing the research and visiting the places. And I know you've traveled a bit abroad and been mm-hmm. to Israel and some different places. How has that impacted your writing? You have to create an experience for your reader that is only ink on a page. And that is a very difficult thing to do. I talk a lot with musicians. If you listen to my podcast, I love to interview other creative artists, but music has the ability to shorten the gap to your emotions. So you can get someone crying in three minutes. If that makes sense. I mean, you can a really well-crafted song with poignant lyrics and emotive music can have someone in three minutes. A book doesn't work that way. You're three minutes into a book. You're not yet at that point where you're showing emotion. Maybe you're intrigued. Maybe a really great opening line has you going, okay, I'll spend more of my precious minutes on this earth reading this story. But the payoff, though, with a book is that people will get more vested in a book than they will in a song over time. Now, maybe a song impacts you and that's fine and you remember it years later, but you will quickly move to the next song. Whereas with a book, there are some books that you read and affect you forever and you'll never forget reading them. I read Tarzan of the Apes when I was eight years old. That was another one of those books that had such atmosphere and emotion in it that I just, it it affected me. And so I think this is a roundabout way of answering. With a book, you create a sense of I'm there, I smell things, I see things, I feel things. So the payoff is much more intense for your reader. And that requires you to go to these locations. In my contention, it's possible to write great historical fiction having never touched the ground somewhere. But I do think it's the best case scenario if you're writing about Roman gladiators to go stand in the Colosseum and just even though it's a decrepit, decaying old ruin, you still get some sense of the sounds that you're hearing. And maybe it's the traffic of modern day Rome, but just translate that into the screaming and shouting of people and the roaring of lions. And there's just no substitute for it, especially I write these books based on biblical battles and warriors. And so these are very specific locations that the Bible talks about these events panning out in. So For example, there will be the Valley of Rephaim outside of Jerusalem. Many battles were fought there over the years in the Bible. But the Bible just says things like, and then they fought and this happened, which is not a critique of the Bible. It's just that its purpose is to teach you the lesson and give you what you need to know. But the battle lasted longer than the one sentence that it described. And so if I'm going to create a fictional account of that battle to where, yes, I'm making it up, but I'm taking what the Bible gives me and I'm standing there looking at, okay, that hilltop right there is a really good observation position. If I was a commander in this day and age, I would have a scout up there. I mean, things like that, that I, you know, this creek over here would have looked like this. You can just paint that picture for your reader. And once the setting is firm in their mind, I think that the, that's part of the location process is that you're getting them there to where they're now living the action as you write it. Another thing I bet you get asked a lot, aspiring writers, up and coming writers probably ask you, what's your best piece of advice And so I'm going to ask you that same thing. If a new writer or somebody who's early on in their career approached you and said, you know, what's the best piece of advice you've had or what can I do as somebody who's just starting out? uh, How might you answer that question? You have got to make people care about what you're doing. (laughs) It's the simplest way to do it. No one cares about your book, but you, they don't. I mean, your mom does. Sure. Your grandma is proud of you. But I had to learn early on. I think what helped me was I approached it from that level. I knew, okay, I know that my mom's going to love it, whatever I do. When I got married, my wife will speak lovingly and honestly to me about whether I have any talent for it, but she's going to be for me. I mean, there's a circle in your life that is going to be for you. The danger is they can also hide the truth from you. They're not going to be able to give you objective feedback. Even if it's really good, if your only feedback is from those who love you, it's going to be tainted by, oh, this is better than I thought. That's how they're viewing it. They're, they're like, okay, I was prepared to be happy for you because you're my husband or my son or cousin or whatever, but this is better than I thought. You should pursue this. And that's a huge blinking red light of danger. And it's why TV shows like American Idol did so well, is that someone told those people when they walked in the door, you can sing. Yeah, you should go for it. You're really talented. And they go there in front of objective third-party listeners who go, nah, you're not worth that. I mean, <laughs> you can't do it. I can't make money selling what you're putting out. And so I think of a budding young writer or a budding writer of any age decides they want to pursue this, making people care by producing good stuff, knowing what your goals are. Is your goal to be a famous best-selling author? Know that that is very, very rare, very unlikely. And unless you have stumbled onto something that is totally, um, I don't want to say unique because there's nothing new under the sun, but there's a slant on something that you're doing that 
has that stickiness factor for people to latch onto. If you don't have that, you're just going to tell yet another story set in the old West about such and such. You're just not going to get there with it. It's just not likely. So you need to understand, okay, is my goal then a publishing deal? I don't care about being JK Rowling and Harry Potter. I just want a publishing deal. That's more likely still tough, especially in this day and age, but it's more likely if you set the bar there and then really work on your craft, put your time in at conferences, get to know agents, things like that, then you are increasing your chances of success. And then finally, I guess another tier that you have to be okay with is that this is where I got over time was I wrote my first book, researched it, poured everything I had into it. It cost me a lot of my sanity, a lot of my, you know, my late nights. I was up after the kids were down, my wife was down. I was, I called it my 10 to midnight time. That was the only four hours I had or two hours I had in a day. I worked three jobs. I was a pastor, was a soldier. I was doing all these things and I had 10 to midnight. And if I didn't use that time, it wasn't going to happen. So it doesn't matter how great my idea was, how wonderful the manuscript was going to turn out to be and all these things. I had to get it done in the time that I had to get it done in. And so God was faithful to let me have that time. It was grinding. It was tough. It was grueling. But he gifted that to me. I mean, I, I was able to have 10 to midnight. And I wrote my first novel from 10 o'clock to midnight every night for six months. And, I, and I, maybe not every night, but most nights for six months. And I got through it. And so I think you got to be prepared to sacrifice time and effort and anxiety. Um, <laughs> it's going to come at a cost at the end of the day. And then, and then when you're done, when that blinking cursor is after the, your last period, you have to be okay with no one's ever going to read this but God. You have to be okay with that. And if that's your standard as if, Lord, I did this as an act of offering to you. This is me pouring out my water vase. This is me ending myself and saying, I'm okay with no one ever reading this but you. I wanted to do this for you. Then anything that comes beyond that's going to feel like Christmas morning because that was your standard. Is he worth my time to do this in an act of worship? Just like a worship leader strumming a guitar, writing a song. It's an act of worship. I believe writing is that. And so if it was worth his time and he was your audience, that has to be sufficient. That was hard for me. I don't want to make it sound like that's easy to do, but I had to die to any other things coming out of it. But once I did that, I felt like other doors started opening and that my stuff had more of a fate than just, you know, on my laptop. Yeah. Well, and I, I think that's a good perspective to have because really behind the scenes, there are some different gatekeepers. There are acquisitions agent, agents at each publisher. There, If you're going to go an agented route, you know, and submitting something to an agent could be a good litmus test for am I, is my manuscript or what's done of my manuscript, is it ready to be even presented to a publisher? I, you know, I think feedback from your wife and your mom, that's one level. But once you start getting into the actual publishing industry, acquisitions editors, agents, that's a whole new level of feedback where I think you'll be able to test, is this where it needs to be before it can be presented to the gatekeepers? And like you said, sometimes it may never see the light of day. Sometimes it will. Mm-hmm. Self-publishing, I guess, could be another route if somebody can't get an acquisitions editor or an agent to take it on. You know, there have been people that have been successful that way too. People in my circles, your circles, people we know that Mm -hmm. do very well with self-publishing. But yeah, you got to develop a thick skin, if you will, to walk through that process because you're going to get feedback and you're not always Mm going to like it. No, I mean, there's no one. I think Stephen King once said, only God doesn't need an editor. So (laughs) I think that's so accurate. And this is one of the best-selling writers of all time. And, And you realize that everybody has to go through that stress test of, and I think what's nice is that if a publisher will not engage with you, if they don't think you have talent. And so you have to remember they're only engaging with you because you have talent. And what they're doing is when they give you your feedback and your critiquing is not that they hate your soul and want you to die. It's that they're saying, no, we think you can do this. And more importantly, and this is being very mercenary, but we think we can make money on what you're doing. That's how talented we think you are, but you have to fix these 75 things. (laughs) And so I think that's a process. But then back on self-publishing a minute, I very, very much support and I'm a fan of self-publishing. I have benefited. In fact, my career is possible by some of the self-publishing things that I do. Love to partner with Bethany on this series, but I think you view a publisher as a partnership that works in certain scenarios. I hope this is a profitable one. It's a great one, but Bethany needs their options and I need my options. And so I think if you approach it, if you're approaching your author career as a career, you keep that in mind. Like I'm going to do everything I can to make this work with Bethany and also have other options because, you know, there's other ways in this day and age to get your content out there. So I have self-published stuff. I have a, a company that we publish things through that we do well with. And I like that because I have full creative freedom. I have access to great editing, great design work, all that stuff. And I can churn out generally the same product and not have to deal with lots of layers of bureaucracy or things like that. So 
hey, look, I'm a fan of all of them. I'm not one of those people that's like, you've got to be a published by a traditional publisher or you're, you know, you're worth nothing. And I'm also not that, ah, the heck with traditional publishers, do it all yourself. I believe that every book and project and author is different and it can be customized to be you know, successful in either way. I think the option that's going to be appropriate for any given author, it's going to vary by what their goals are, the audience they want to reach. And like you said, self-publishing is certainly a viable route, especially if you want a lot of license and creative freedom, because when you publish with a traditional publishing house, you're going to be working with editors who, are, like you said, are going to have, we do want to make money at some point. It would be mm-hmm. a good thing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but they are going to put more boundaries around you. If you want to pursue a project where you can just do what you want, present it how you want, for some projects, self-publishing may be the right route. I'm glad you brought that up because that is an important topic if your listeners are this crowd. If there's these budding authors that are wondering you know, what goes on behind the scarlet cloak of a publisher, it's a, you know, you guys have very dark and mysterious islands that you live on in the, the minds of a new writer. I've been there. And I think you're right. That, that's one of those things where you have to remember that these are wonderful people, great people. They, they mean well. They want to create great product, but it's still a business. They have to pay their employees and they have to make a profit. And so it's unfair sometimes what we as authors hold on a publisher in the way of, well, you just want to snuff my dream out and you don't want to, you know, you want to ruin my manuscript. Like, no, they want your book to sell. They've got to keep the lights on. They've got to employ people who have families and all this stuff. And there's also a very healthy vetting process. I think publishers are amazing for their ability to screen for talent. We don't hold that against the NFL or the NBA, have talent scouts and agents out there looking for talent. Publishers should do the same. And that's how I do believe the cream will rise to the top. And plus too, and what's fun about Bethany, and I know we're on a Bethany kind of show here, but, but I, these guys have been awesome because they're willing to take a chance on my stuff. My stuff has sold pretty well, but it's still not their bread and butter. Bethany is known. This is not an insult. This is just observing. They're known for more female-driven historical fiction, and they've done very well with it. I admire their ability to know their audience and provide stuff for their audience. I admire them even more for being willing to, even if it wasn't me, take on something like my project because it is very violent and very heavy. And the last few pages, Caleb's got a head hanging from his belt. So I mean, a little bit of a spoiler alert, but I I think it's just to give you an idea of, I portray the realities of ancient warfare. And Bethany has been amazing giving me that leash. I'm at far more than I ever would have dreamed. And they've let me, I guess, go to the line. If, if you want to know what the line is, as far as violence in a Christian novel in the retail market, you can pretty much, I'm the one that established that line was with Zondervan. It was with the line of war series. I mean, we had talks with Lifeway and all of them about what's allowable, what's not allowable. And I'm just proud to have those battle buddies like Bethany who are willing to go to war over something and say, no, we think this has an audience and a message and it needs to be written the way that it is. So that's where if you have a good experience with a publisher, these are people who will fight for you and for your project. And Bethany has been awesome for that. I'm encouraged to hear that you've had a good experience working with us. And Mm -hmm. to my knowledge, we haven't had a lot of decapitations in our Amish fiction novels. (laughs) I have not read all of them, but I'm pretty sure... (laughs) Not a yeah. lot of. I don't think Beth that sort Lewis of has a lot of de- beheadings in her Amish fiction. No, so. no, no, no. I don't think we'll see that anytime soon or ever. Or yeah, ever. right. <laughs> Just in case people are getting nervous. Okay, yeah, you're safe. Another thing I wanted to touch on, you've mentioned briefly that you've you've got a company. You are doing some different kinds of media. Uh, I believe it's called Five Stones Media. Mm-hmm. On the one hand, I do want to hear about your podcasting because that's something that's near and dear to my heart. But give us a sense of, of the range of things you're doing, some of the different projects, and then maybe close that question off with the the different podcasting projects. So I think I realized early on that the ability to just sit down in a writer's cabin somewhere and crank out a manuscript and then email it in and then let everyone else do everything for me, I learned quickly that that was not the case. And so to make a career out of storytelling, I guess that's the best way I can think of to put it, make a career out of storytelling is you either have the lightning in a bottle moment where you get one huge hit it's the shack, it's left behind, just publishing phenomena wise, something like that happens. Or, you know, again, you write a Harry Potter series, or you write a screenplay for a movie that becomes a blockbuster. There's that lightning in the bottle. And that does happen. It's just extraordinarily rare. But you can make a good living telling stories if you're savvy with how you promote how you market how you get your stuff out there. And so and you're comfortable selling yourself to people. I'm comfortable doing that because I believe in what I'm doing. I'm not trying to tell everyone, look at how great I am. I'm just trying to tell people, look at how cool these stories are. I really think you need to engage with them. That was the foundational idea behind me starting to piece together this transmedia approach. 
lots of avenues of telling the story, lots of ways to make revenue out of it, speaking and things like that, that, that we patched together over the years. I was incredibly, and I, I will plant my flag on this, I was incredibly fortunate and blessed to develop friendships with really world-class filmmakers early on in my career. And their belief in me and in my abilities and our partnership has opened up more doors than I can counter. You know, it, it really opened a lot of doors for me. So my path is not necessarily the one that I think people should just look at going down because I had some fortuitous things happen. I just want to recognize that, that the hand of God was at play with that. And so, but it did give me the ability to look at more media capable stuff. And so we've got some movies that are being made based on my King David series that are going to be big and epic and major studio releases. Those partnerships and relationships have opened doors to where we produced a music album called Praise and Arrows. As far as we know, it was the first ever novel series inspired compilation album. And we had a great lineup of artists who are fans of my stuff that signed on for it for King and Country. They're not on the album, but I've partnered with them on some stuff. Kevin Max is on the album, All Sons and Daughters. I mean, there's just a lot of these groups that came on board with that to create our music side, if you will. And so we've got that album out with other albums in development. We were at the music festivals promoting to that crowd. So comic books, we have our first comic book out, a few others coming down the pipe. You know, and then, of course, to wrap this up on the podcasting, that's a new media phenomena, which is ironic because it's been around for a long time, but people are content consumers now. They want to be able to stream and get everything quickly all the time. And so I know you have a passion for podcasting and you do it very well and it's a very good show. And I'm trying to emulate guys like you by creating content that hopefully I'm interesting to listen to and interview people with. And so I can get that to my listeners who may be readers and they may not be readers, but they're engaged on the things I care about, whether it's our work fighting child sex trafficking, whether it's telling stories, whether it's talking to a music artist about the creative process, any of that stuff. Podcasting is a great format because it's not hurried and harried all the time. You're not cutting off for commercial breaks and like what we're going on, we can go on for 30 minutes or more and not feel rushed about it. And so I think that's the podcasting as an avenue. I realized that also saves a lot of time for me traveling and speaking. I have a young family, uh, you know, ages eight, six, four, and three. And so I don't like to be gone from them. And when I do travel, I want to bring them with me, the whole circus. And so the podcasting allows me to go into my studio office and cord and talk about the things I'm passionate about and share things without having to leave home all the time. And then, of course, one last quick little plug here. I've got my Good Battle podcast, which is people can just find it at Good Battle. It's the name of it, where I do the interviews and topics of the day kind of stuff. But then the Hall of the Mighty Men, this is independently published and produced through my company, Five Stones Media. They are short stories. They're almost origin stories for my King David series. And it's based on each character. So if you look at the list of David's mighty men in 2 Samuel 23, there's between 35 and 37 of them that we know about. And I'm trying to write a story for each one of them and their background. Now, nothing is known about these guys other than their name mentioned in that list. And so I'm trying to create the world of King David a series of stories, and they are recorded and cut. They're about 30 minutes an episode. But it's like the old Orson Welles War of the Worlds approach where you tell a story serialized episode by episode. I read it. It's produced by a professional audiobook producer. I've got music and everything like that in it. And people have loved that. It's available for free. People love free content. We're trying to get in every month. We're going to release a new one episodically that people can enjoy and engage on to create more fans. Now, are you releasing both basically like an audiobook version? And there's also like a, a written version that they can read it also? Or Yes. Yeah, so there are written versions. We have really zoned in on electronic singles. Like anything else that had a, a fad and then it faded away, but we've stayed the course on it because I still think that for a lot of men, the idea of packing a book is harder for them than to download it to their cell phone or have their Kindle. A lot of men read on Kindle, I've noticed that, so or on their iPad. And we released some short stories a few years ago that started this off and about now about once every other month or so, I'm releasing a new entry in that and they sell very well and they've become popular. Now, I'm still missing some of that audience where if I had a very traditional publishing plan where we've got it printed and bound and mass distributed. Yeah, I'm going to miss some of those people. But it's profitable. This is my business hat on. It's profitable to go digital. And then it also gets the story out there. So if people want to be a fan of what I do, they can find my stuff. And then the audio format just adds that many more people to the roster of who can engage. So even though we don't have a huge, robust print strategy necessarily for those short stories, people can now get them on a free download in the podcasting service, or they can get them on their Kindle or iPad or something like that. I just want to touch on something you brought up in this last part of your story. A big thing in your career, it sounds like, and for me too, has been networking, 
connecting with other people who are working in the space that I want to be a part of and working in. And whether it's serving your community through producing a podcast, interviewing people, or creating content that people are going to connect with, I just want to encourage authors and others who are starting out, or maybe you want to get in publicity like I'm uh, doing. I'm only five years into this career, but it all started with networking and meeting people and stepping out of my comfort zone and just building relationships. So whether you want to be an author, you want to do PR, whatever you want to do, you got to be willing to meet new people, fellowship with other believers. And it's interesting how once you start doing that, making connections and serving, often that will come back around and those same people will be serving you and helping you when you need something down the road. But really, you just want to encourage people to step outside of your comfort zone and reach out, make an effort. Oh, I, I 100% agree with that. You've got to be, and, and here's the danger because, you know, as Christians, we are rightly concerned about promoting ourselves too much. That is the tension. I'm sorry out there, budding writer, budding musician, whatever you are, you have got to get over that. <laughs> you, you're not going to get your story out there to people unless you become a champion of the material. Now, that's very different than promoting yourself. I read the blogosphere and people on Twitter complaining about, well, these authors talking about their latest book. Well, yeah, that's your resume. That's how you make your living. You want to talk about your book. You have to talk about your book. And so if you've, if, you know, if you've got an idea to tell a story and just think that you're going to turn into a publisher and they're going to do everything for you, they have a, a responsibility to help you. But you've got to be okay with a 30-second elevator pitch. And someone asks you, what's your book about? You tell them, I write stories about King David and his mighty men told in the style of Braveheart and Band of Brothers. That was my elevator pitch for six years. And it worked. I mean, people were able to grab it quickly and realize what I was about and... Off we went. Cliff, if the listeners want to learn more about you, your writing, your podcast, where are some of the best places for them to connect with you on the web? First of all, I want to thank them for taking the time to listen to me. I'm a, I'm a loudmouth kind of guy, so I don't mean to preach and rant, but I, uh, I'm passionate about what I do. You can learn about me at cliffgraham.com. It's my name.com, C-L-I-F-F-G-R-A-H-A-M.com. My Twitter is at Cliff Graham, and I'm on Facebook too, Cliff Graham Author. But my website kind of funnels everybody there. So if you go to my website, you can see the podcasts, you can see social media, the projects that I'm working on. We're teeing up some Israel tours where I'm leading groups of people over there to the site to walk the battlefields of the novels. I mean, all sorts of great stuff we have coming down the pipe. Get movie updates there as those come down and can learn all about what we're working on. Well, and also I'll just mention with all the different podcasts, the different books, uh, resources that he's recommended. I'll include links in the show notes for the episode. So if folks want to go to SeanTabbitt.com, they can just click through on those links there just to make it easy for everybody. And uh, as it is every time, it's time to bring this episode of the Sean Tabbitt Show to a close. Many thanks to all of you for being a part of our conversation today about Shadow of the Mountain. And for more on Cliff, as he said, for his books, podcasts, and all the things he's got going on, you can visit his website at CliffGram.com. For more on Shadow of the Mountain and to keep a watch out for upcoming books in the series, It'll be a little while because this first one just came out, but you can check that out at the publisher's website, which is bethanyhouse.com. And Cliff, just want to say thanks so much for sharing with us today. It's been a great pleasure speaking with you. Thank you, Sean. It was an honor. I love the show and appreciate your time today. And that's all for this episode of The Sean Tabbitt Show. If you have a question, comment, or suggestion, you can connect with me via email using show at seantabbitt.com. Be sure to follow me on Twitter, where I go by the Twitter handle at stabbitt. And if you enjoy the show, head on over to iTunes and leave us a review. Until next time, this is your host, Sean Tabbitt, signing off.